something I've been anticipating. It's marvelous age where we can meet together on Zoom, but so much better to be physically present, isn't it? Uh, really enjoying this morning on that basis. A little concerned about the glass of water. That's a lot of water. It must mean an awfully dry speaker. So uh, we'll see what comes from that. But we're going to read from uh, John's Gospel, chapter 17 and verse 1. This is uh, the Lord's prayer, his prayer before uh, the cross. And we're just going to read the first verse. But I hope, I hope there's something from this that will encourage you to read through the whole prayer uh, in a very thoughtful way. Verse 1 says, Jesus spoke these words, lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that your Son also may glorify you. <clears throat> Have something in my throat. Okay. Jesus spoke these words. The words that he spoke were the words of chapters 14, 15, and 16. If you drop your eye down to verse 4 for a second, <clears throat> in the middle of the verse he says, I have finished the work which you have given me to do. The Lord Jesus had finished his earthly work at this point. Chapter 13, we read a little bit of it earlier. <clears throat> Pardon me. Um, finished his earthly work, he uh, ate the last supper. He came to do his father's will. He had done his father's will. He came to uh, fulfill all the law. He fulfilled all the law uh, and the prophets and the writings. Uh, and he instituted something new, the Lord's Supper. Uh, Lord's Supper should never be confused with, with the Old Testament uh, Passover and uh, the Seder. But anyway, uh, he had done that. And in chapter 14, he says, I'm leaving you, going away, going to the Father's house, going to prepare a place for you. And then he says, oh, I will come back. But in the meantime, while I'm away, I'm going to send the Spirit. These are the things that are being referred to here. In chapter 15, he says, I'm the vine, you're the branches. Uh, even though I'm going to be away from you, it will not break our relationship. The Spirit of Christ is in us as believers that we can live fruitful lives, bearing the fruit of the Spirit during this time while he is away. And in chapter 16, it explains the, the function of the Spirit more fully, including that he would um, convict the world of sin and righteousness and justice. And having said these things, he, he's, he's preparing them for his leaving. Having spoken these words, he lifted up his eyes to heaven. Uh, I hope it's worthwhile saying that he's got a, a new perspective now. He's been concerned with the things of earth. Now he's looking to the heavens. He's looking to um, eternal things rather than temporal things. He's looking to spiritual things rather than uh, 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 fleshly things. He, he's looking to um, uh, living things rather than dying things. He lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father. He did not say God. He said, Father. Now, his father is God. Uh, but as far as that goes, he himself in his eternal person is God. Uh, so is the Spirit. But he's speaking here as a man. 
and he lifts his eyes up to the heavens and he says, Father, he's speaking of a relationship. All that he's speaking of here has to do with the eternal life that is in him, a relationship as son with father and doing the father's will, glorifying the father that the father may glorify him and so on. And so he uh, lifts his eyes up to heaven, says, Father, and then he says, the hour has come. This is a particular hour. You and I, I, we understand this is the hour of the cross that he's speaking of, but um, the hour had come. It was, in a way, the hour of his enemies. Uh, you remember when they came to arrest him in the garden, uh, he said, uh, this is your hour and the power of darkness. Um, it was their hour. It's an hour of judgment. They judged him worthy of the cross. His throat is not going to leave me alone here. They judged him worthy of the cross. For his earthly ministry, they had recognized who he was right from his birth, you remember? And all the way through, they recognized him. Um, he went about doing good. I love that description of him. And for all the good that he did, they loved him. They followed him, crowds followed him. Why wouldn't you follow somebody who's going to do for you what you want? Heal my sickness, feed my hunger, etc. But as soon as he spoke anything more to them, they abandoned them. And so at this hour that is come, with one voice, they would lift up their hearts and say, we will not have this man to rule over us. Crucify him. Get rid of him. They assume that um, their understanding and their thinking was reality. Sounds rather contemporary, doesn't it? But um, we know otherwise. It was not only the hour of his enemies. It was his father's hour, too. His father also judged him worthy of the cross. But an entirely different kind of justice a an entirely different kind of righteousness, an entirely different kind of, of goodness. Here was the only man that ever existed that his father could trust with that death of the cross. He came to do his father's will. He did his father's will. And in fact, uh, he himself knows what's coming. And that's what he's praying about here. And so he says, this hour has come. In that sense, it's also his hour. It's his hour to demonstrate uh, a greater glory. We'll speak of that in just a second. And I'd like to suggest it's also our hour. It's for us, he died. And every man, every woman, every child has to um, uh, respond in one way or another. It's either we will not have this man to rule over us, or here I am, Lord, my life is yours. Do with me as you will. Uh, it's our hour as well. And, and so he goes on to say, 
the hour has come. Glorify your son that your son may also glorify you. This prayer is very much about glory. I, I rather like that. The first brother that um, opened the meeting this morning gave out a hymn and we sang that hymn, but he also read the last verse of another hymn, and it was the emphasis on the glory. <laughs> and this, this uh, prayer of our Lord Jesus refers to glory at least, I think it's seven or eight times through this prayer. He's, it's a prayer about glory. Glory is the visible display of the inner life, of the reality of a person. Everybody has some kind of a glory. But what, what is your glory? Well, you show your glory by the way you live, by the way you act, by the way you relate, by the values that you have. Some people are wondrously glorious in, in wealth, very skilled at prospering, at making uh, money at uh, success and all that. Some people are very uh, glorious athletically, physical ability that can accomplish beyond others. Some are glorious in, in uh, friendliness and sociability and some in, in intellect and on and on and on and on. You can go, everybody has some kind of a glory, but how do you know what a person's glory is, the only evidence you have is what you can see of that person. And here the Lord cries out, glorify your son, that your son also may glorify you. And I like that. That takes us back to that relationship, lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, uh, a father reproduces himself in his sons, doesn't he? And daughters. And for that matter, I think a mother does also. But um, a father reproduces himself, not just biologically, not just physically, but he raises his children. He teaches them. He trains them. I don't know if there's ever been a young child that ever was excited about going to school very long. You know, at some point or another, most kids say, oh, I don't want to go to school anymore. You know, it's no fun. It's hard work. But of course, parents know a little bit better. And, uh, as they get older, they'll thank you for having them suffer going to school. <laughs> That's a silly illustration, but I think you get the point of that. Um, the fathers not only care for their son and nurture them and, and give them good things, but also train them and, and uh, encourage them in ways that are very difficult. They know they're capable of better things. Well, here the son says, glorify your son, that your son also may glorify you. This hour that has come is the hour of the cross, rejected by the whole world, Jew and Gentile alike. It wasn't just Israel. Also the, the, the Roman authority of the world in those parts anyway in those days. And interestingly, all of them uh, judged him with a legal trial. In fact, he had six trials, three at the hands of the Jews and three at the hands of, of the governors of the day, two with Pilate and one with Herod, I think. And uh, in every case, he was found innocent couldn't find a charge to bring against him. But we will not have this man to rule over us. Crucify him. 
Pilate said, why, what's he done? Crucify him. Okay, crucify him, and he did. Why would he crucify an innocent man? Very simple, the world is skilled at its glory. If you don't crucify him, we're gonna tell Caesar. You're supporting another king, a different king. Now it's personally important to Caesar. And he judges to crucify him. Quite a thing, isn't it? The world is skilled at getting its way. But if it can't get its way, it'll get rid of the problem. And I mentioned earlier, this hour that he speaks of is also our hour. That's true in a gospel sense. I think it's also true in a COVID-19 sense. You've probably heard repeatedly, things will never be the same again. And they won't. I'm absolutely convinced of that. And there are already uh, efforts made to control society in a different way. And there are already stipulations for churches that are enforced. Well, we can justify them. Uh, and I'm not suggesting that we're at a place right now where that's a, a particular problem, but it's just the cutting edge, isn't it? There's going to come a time, and perhaps not so long from now. Uh, in fact, maybe today is that time when we as Christians need to face up to our hour. Who is my authority? Where do I draw the line? We can be very gracious. We can draw that line a long ways down the road. But at some point, we have to stand and say, this is my Lord, Jesus Christ. And, and so I would set this before you as a very um, contemporary issue. Father, Glorify your son that your son also may glorify you. Well, the Lord Jesus in eternity as the father's son is God, isn't he? How do you glorify God? You cannot add to his glory. It is perfect. It is complete. It is absolutely full. But he's not speaking as God. He's speaking as a man. He's speaking as a man who has demonstrated the fullness of everything that the Old Testament could expect in a man. He was glorious by any human standard. Read the Gospels. Marvelous how he functioned far superior to all other men. But that's not the fullness of his glory as a man. There's an hour that came, the hour of the cross, in which man will be shown with eternal life, not temporal life. He is still capable of dying here. Thank God he did die, but he rose to eternal life, never to die again. Isn't that so? That's the glory that he shows, the glory that he gives to us, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life, everlasting life. And so the Father uh, has to send him to the cross. I say has to send him, wants to send him. That's why he sent him to earth in the first place. But the Lord says, glorify me. 
father had to trust him with the cross, uh, why wouldn't he? Well, in Gethsemane's garden, the Lord cried out, if there's any other way, Father, if there's any other way, let this cup pass. But only as you will. Came to do his Father's will, did his Father's will. And he could only go to the cross if it was his Father's will. And here's his son. This is so horrific if there's any other way. May it be, your will be done. What father wouldn't want to rescue his son there? <laughs> well, thank God our heavenly father didn't want to rescue his son because his son is glorious, far more glorious than they had ever seen until the cross. And so he went to the cross to glorify the father. And you remember, as he carried his cross, there were women weeping for him, sympathizing with him, uh, compassionating over him. Poor man. You remember his answer? He stopped and he spoke to them. He says, don't weep for me. Weep for your children. We, we, we easily confuse the cross with our natural inclinations and tendencies. It wasn't uh, him that should be wept for. Lost mankind. And so they crucified him. You know the horrors of the cross physically. We dwell on them a lot. Sometimes we forget that there were other horrors too. They not only abused him physically, but emotionally and, and spiritually and, and socially and all the rest. They mocked him, they scorned him, they ridiculed him, they blasphemed him, they taunted him and they tempted him as well. There wasn't a part of his person and not a part of his personality that wasn't utterly rejected there. And you remember his response? Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Can you imagine yourself in that condition? The other two that were crucified with him show us our own selves. That they, they, they would respond in kind. And you know how easily and how readily we respond in kind. We may have great patience up to a point, but we always come to our point. And, and then... We respond very naturally, don't we? Not at all supernaturally. But our Lord says, Father, forgive them. Wow, this is pretty glorious, isn't it? Uh, the Father did. It says the Lord laid on him the iniquity of us all. This is no... Uh, gimmick. It's not a, a, a spiritual trickery of God. He's not a sham savior himself bore our sins in his own body on that cross. Um, so truly that he lifts up his voice again. He says, Father, uh, sorry, he didn't say Father. He said, God, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Have you ever thought about that? Do you know what that means? 
If you do, I'd like to know, please let me know what that means. The simple fact is there isn't a human being that ever walked this earth that has ever been forsaken of God to this very day. He causes the rain to fall and the sun to shine on the good and the evil, the just and the unjust. God so loved the world that he gave his son. It was his son that was forsaken. The, the, the best thought that I can ever come up with on this forsakenness is it would be for us eternal hell. But even that doesn't come to it because he exhausted all the justice of God and he satisfied all the righteousness of God for you and for me. If we could do that, our hell would not be eternal. He stands alone, doing his Father's will, and so forsaken of God his Father, despised and rejected of man, forsaken by God. And what's he do? Marvelous, glorious response. His voice comes up again and it's Father again. Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. He trusted his Father. Even in God forsakenness, he trusted his father. How glorious is his father that he can be trusted with even this. Oh, Father, glorify your son that your son might glorify you. And so he bowed his head. He breathed his last. He gave himself into the hands of the very God and Father that had uh, rejected him or uh, forsaken him there. Um, I think just on the level of his moral righteousness, you couldn't fault him for his love, for his kindness, for his uh, goodness, faithfulness, meekness, all those things. You couldn't fault him. Who, who, who could ever measure that? Uh, on, on the level of a legal justice or righteousness, the sin had to be paid, and, and he takes it to the fullest and he pays it to the absolute fullest. There's no compromise. There's no easy way around it. There's no secondary way through it or some such thing. There isn't an aspect of glory that he doesn't reveal in his death at the cross. And that to the glory of God his Father. Wonderful. And so he's in the grave. But you remember he said, I, I have the authority to lay down my life and I have the authority to take it up again. He took it up again. It's true, God his Father raised him from the dead, but it's also true he took up his life again from the dead. And I suppose that means it's also true that the Spirit of God raised him up from the dead. But however you look at that, here's the glory of the power of God, of his righteousness, of his justice, of his love, of his mercy, of his grace and goodness and every other thing. 
I really enjoyed that remembrance this morning. There were several thoughts, both in the hymns and also in, in the prayers that r referred to this glory of God. And um, he rose again, alive. Uh, spent a few days on the earth, went back to his father. What did his father do? You know, he received him, didn't he? Received him with joy and celebration. Think of this. Uh, Hebrew says, our God is a consuming fire. I want you to think of that. And, and here's a consuming fire, and he, he wraps his arms, his flaming arms around the Lord Jesus when he accepts him. Fire does a couple of things. One thing it does is it destroys, it burns up everything that is inconsistent with itself. Himself bore our sin in his own body on that cross. But having risen from the dead, when the Father embraced him with those arms of flame, there was nothing to burn up. It was paid, it was gone. Justice was accomplished fully and righteously and satisfyingly. He was pure. The other thing that fire does is purifies that which is compatible with itself. And as he put his arms around him, there was nothing in the Lord Jesus to purify. He was pure. Always did his Father's will. Lovely, isn't it? Here's the wonder of it. For you, for me. And here we are today, okay? You read Ephesians 1 and 2. We're accepted in his son. Was he received? He was. We were received in him, accepted in him. Was he seated at the right hand of God? So are we in him. Uh, crowned with glory and honor? So are we in him. Clothed with royal robes of majesty? So are we in him. Wonderful, isn't it? What a savior. I can't talk about you. I'll only talk about myself. Thank him. Praise him. Honor him. Serve him. Glorify him. There's far too much in me that is not worthy of him. We, 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 we do worship him, don't we? We do serve him, but how well? Still, he loves us. Still, our sin has been paid. We don't have to be saved again. We don't have to think that we're second-rate children of God? No, eternal life, eternal salvation, eternal glory. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. What a day that will be. And, and we'll, we'll experience those arms of fire around us in another way at that judgment seat of Christ, tried by fire. <laughs> Thank God for it. But the hour had come, and it's an hour of decision. The world rejected him. His father accepted him. It's also our hour. As believers, we have received him. If you're not, this is your opportunity. But I have to say, as believers, it's still our hour to make that decision. Are we going to have one foot in the world and one foot in the Lord? Is it going to be 
God's way. If I like it, if I agree with it, if it satisfies me, if it entertains me, if it makes me happy, if it doesn't cause any pain, I think we all have to make decisions every day. The decision to do his will, to ask him to glorify us that we might glorify him on this earth. And uh, I better stop talking at this point. I never know how to end. Father, we bow in your presence. We thank you. Thank you for your marvelous love to us, for giving your son, Lord Jesus, that you should so truly take us upon yourself as to save us for all eternity. We praise you. And we recognize the world that we live in has not changed and our flesh that tempts us so much every day yields to that worldly stuff. Just pray that in your grace and mercy you would uh, continue to open our eyes Fill us with your spirit. Strengthen us in the things of the Lord that we might uh, make our stand. Not foolishly, Father, but knowing when it is an issue that is contrary to yourself, that we might draw the line and say, no, your will be done. And so we thank you again for all that you are to us in your Son, our Savior. And we pray in his name. Amen. Amen. I hope it made some sense. <laughs>